Over the past decade or so, the writer and commentator Christopher Hitchens has been a regular guest on Late Line. We've spoken to him about war and racial conflict and politics and the world-changing attacks on America on September 11, 2001, which prompted him to finally swear an allegiance and take U.S. citizenship. Well, now at the tender age of 60-something, he's gone from the political to the personal. And he's written a revealing memoir, Hitch 22, it's called. I spoke to him here in the studio just a short time ago. Christopher Hitchens, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, let's start with an inquiry that you put to yourself in a kind of Proustian questionnaire. Uh, what is your most marked characteristic? Your answer was insecurity. Yes. What are you insecure about? <clears throat> Being overpraised is the most recent one. <clears throat> so, so, my... so it was an ironic comment. No, everyone thinks my stuff is so great and I keep reading uh, how brilliant I am. And I, I often think, no, this is uh, whatever it is, if it's whatever hubris would be if it was someone else saying it about me instead of myself. It does make you nervous sometimes. Are you seriously you insecure about what you write? It's they hard to imagine. There was a great journalist, um, Scotsman, called James Cameron, who was a, a big figure in my youth when I was trying to read and imbibe good essayists and good reporters. And uh, he said, in his Dundee accent, I can hear him saying it, he said, every time I roll the paper into the typewriter, I think today's the day they're going to find me out. <laughs> <laughs> and it haunted me. And sometimes I read stuff about myself that I don't think is really all that merited. And of course that makes me feel insecure, yes. Let's go to... Long, uh, made, long made this illusion flourish. Let's go to where the memoir starts with your mother, Yvonne. And then yes. your account of your relationship with her is moving. It's sad and it's finally quite disturbing, especially at the moment, uh, when you have to rush to Athens to investigate her death. Can you tell us about that? Yes, um, I can. I mean, my mother's death was a crime scene. Um, and it was reported in the newspapers when I first heard and read about it, and on the radio, BBC radio, as a murder. And uh, I knew that she had a secret lover um, who I had approved of. Uh, she wanted me to, and I actually did. So I felt very bad when I, when I thought that he turned into her murderer. Um, but it took me a few days in Athens, a few days in which a military coup had taken place, an extreme right-wing atrocity against the people of Greece as well, which involved some friends of mine. Well, because it was it, almost Shakespearean in a way, wasn't it? I mean, uh, because people you knew uh, from the left in Greece were being picked up off the street, some of them tortured. Well, and all had bullet wounds and didn't dare take them to the hospital because it would identify them as having taken part in the riots. And, and probably some of your older... Well, veteran uh, viewers will remember the, the movie Z, Z, Costa Gavras's movie about the murder of a dissident in Greece. The, the coroner in my mother's case was the coroner who covered up that murder. So it was a sort of Kafka moment for me as well. And, uh, well, sorry if I lose the thread for a second, but I, I had to spend this horrible time as a private investigator. In fact. I found out, in fact, she hadn't been murdered. Um, with the even more unwelcome conclusion that she'd entered into a suicide pact with her, with her lover, which was something that was very difficult for me to tell my father um, and my brother, uh, because there's something very ignominious about, you know, I'd, I'd rather be dead than go on living with you guys. And she left a letter for me, uh, which was also exquisitely painful. And so it took me a very long time before I'd... Really, I couldn't begin the memoir until I'd reached an age where I could, I could soberly write about that. You wrote at the end of that chapter, or the last part of it, a coda on self-slaughter. Mm. And What did it mean for you when you thought about it? Well, there's a lot of work about now, literary work, psychological work, about um, suicide, self-destruction, especially among females. And it usually revolves around the life and work of Sylvia Plath, whose husband, Ted Hughes, I slightly knew. And... I've always been fascinated by the idea of the being or not being a suicidal type. I was quite sure my mother wasn't the suicidal type. That she didn't do it for any grandiose reason. Um, she didn't mean to hurt anybody. She just essentially felt that she'd be better off dead and that so would those who loved her. And this was also very upsetting for me because when I went through the records at the hotel where she was found, I found that she'd 
uh, tried through their switchboard to, to ring me a number of times in London and hadn't got through. And I've never been able to lose the feeling that if she'd, <coughs> um, if she'd been able to contact me, that I would have said something, even if I didn't know why she was calling. Might have made a joke, might have made some familiar remark, that would have stopped her doing it. Um, and it was sort of the end of my family life in a way, because I, or at least with my father and my brother to some extent it was, because it, it created an area where we couldn't really have much of a conversation. Let's move on slightly, and it's, it's hard to move on uh, from that subject, but uh, sometimes memoirs are revealing for what they leave out. In your case, and I'm not alone in saying this, after Yvonne... I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind if you were all by yourself. After, after Yvonne, there's a remarkable absence of women in the, in the overall text. What's going on there? Well, I, I make a special démarche about this at the beginning. I say I only have copyright in myself which is something I feel very strongly. And I'm willing to be confiding to an extent about myself, but I, don't, I can't really tell other people's stories. So where I can, I discard. I hardly describe being married at all, for example, or other um, romances I've had with women. I don't flatter myself. I don't mean, when I say it would, it would be much longer if I put them all in, I don't mean to burst, but it would. I'd have to, in order to do it properly, so, let's say, to be fair. It would have taken up a lot of the text, and um, that wasn't my ambition in the book. It was, my ambition people, in the book is to write about, it, it, even, even when I write about my mother, yeah. if I, uh, this may sound callous, I hope it doesn't to your, to your audience, but if it hadn't taken place in the context of this huge drama in Greece and, and elsewhere, I would have written less about what Athens was like at that time. All of the book is organized around how the various battles of ideas um, and psychodramas have been witnessed by me and so they have to have that to qualify to get in but to be married to you that would qualify you would it not and I mean there are no reflections uh, there are reflections on your children um, and actually your own confession uh, as it were to have been a bad father uh, in some mm, respects no not bad I say abnormally no good <laughs> Um, you know, I, I just assumed that normally no good was I mean, bad. I think most men confess that in the early years of childhood they, they can't, don't quite know what to do and women appear to know amazingly what to do so let them do that bit and then you go off and work as hard as you can and make as much money as you can to finance the project and everyone knows this can be strenuous and in my case it was I think particularly so. I get better with children as they get older. Um, they have it. Well, I mean... That's as reticent as I'm prepared to uh, be. This issue is not going to go away, though. I mean, not when you say things like this to journalists. Uh, no women of mine need ever work. Uh, none of them ever have. It's just as well their day job is me and the yes. Bambini. Was, was that ironic or uh, oh, a genuine statement? I thought, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, obviously, statements like that should be set in some special kind of type, sort of eight-point ironic bold or something, so that people know that what Hitchens says or writes or is quoted as saying in print when uttered may sound just faintly slightly different. Um, maybe there's a bit of a spin on it. Yeah. Reviewers have started pointing out this lack of women in the in the text though. Lynn Barber for example mm. says it's the biggest lacuna in the book and uh, says further all his romantic sentiment is directed at men. Uh, Martin Amos most gushingly yes. it is a love whose month is ever May. That's right. I set out to uh, answer a question that I never had understood needed to be asked before, which is, can you have a heterosexual relationship with a bloke? I don't think anyone has ever asked it in that form before. And in my long chapter about my dearest friend Martin, that's really the question I'm setting myself. Can you, so to speak, be in love with someone for quite a long time without there being anything... Um, sexual about it, or not ostensibly so. Well, I, I'm not even sure I've come up with the right answer. It, it is a brave thing to do because uh, men, as you say, tend not to write about men using those terms, especially not the word love. Well, what, what surprised me most... Was not, the, certainly not in a heterosexual context. No. What surprised me most about Martin, um, about whom, if he was ever to write a book that was just about women, it would, it would, it would still be going on, I mean, it would still be being published. Um, is that he uses the same terms, um, again, unaffectedly, without embarrassment, uh, about love. So I thought, 
Well, love is always a good subject. And when my publisher said to me, there's, there's too much about sex in this book and not, about, not enough about love, I thought, well, you could put that on the jacket. But, they, did, <laughs> but then I said, actually, that's not true. Well, there's a lot about love. Say sex there's a lot about love, it's, except it's just for a chap, and it's um, not sexual. Um, so you can't, here's what I've learned, you can't please everybody. You, you do enter the confessional. Try as I may. You do enter the confessional at times, uh, metaphorically, obviously, in this memoir. For example, you describe same-sex encounters uh, at your English public school. Uh, on one occasion in particular,